Father, we come before you. We thank you for your word. We ask, Lord, as we work through Genesis, that you would work it into our hearts. Thank you for this land that you've given to us. Thank you for the freedoms we enjoy. May we not foolishly let them go. Thank you for those who have served and thank you for those families, Lord, who have surrendered or given one of their loved ones that we might enjoy freedom. We pray your blessing on them this weekend. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy that is new every morning. And may your word open to every heart that's here, every heart that's listening, that your word is truth. Please be with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 7, which of course you're already there, means 2 Peter 3. I already see some of you waiting for me. It's a right turn from Genesis, but then again, every book has a right turn from Genesis. So I'm not very helpful with that one. 2 Peter chapter 3, this second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, <clears throat> both in which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. Verse 2, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Note, he just made the New and Old Testament equal for authority. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. By the way, that's the evolutionist viewpoint with uniform, uniform, uniformitarianism. You try it. Now you feel compassion. For this they are willingly, or willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, verse 6, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Peter has just affirmed there was a global flood. And that global flood was a result of a judgment of God against the world at that time. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. And the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, the elements shall melt with a fervent heat, and the earth and all the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation or manner of living and godliness, looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, the elements shall melt with fervent heat, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Peter is saying, as assuredly as there was a global flood, which there should be evidence for, so most assuredly there will again be another judgment of God, this time with fire. People ask, why are you, you know, you're going through Genesis and you're showing his videos and doing things and all that, and, and you know, Why? Because if you destroy the credibility of the first 11 chapters of Genesis, you destroy the credibility of the rest of the Bible. And a pivotal key chapter to those first 11 chapters is chapter 7. Because in chapter 7, it is told to us the entire planet was covered with water in a global judgment. And so if we can't find any real evidence that would support the idea of a global flood, for example, Mount Everest at 29,000 feet, the top 2,000 plus feet of that mountain is covered in aquatic seashells and sea life. How in the world has the ocean been on top of Mount Everest, the highest, one of the highest mountains we know? Simple, a global flood. 
And so as we work our way through here, yes, there are things we're going through and we're showing you evidence. And time has benefited us because since the last time we've gone through Genesis, we've had the value of creation ministry. So important are those first 11 chapters that there are ministries dedicated solely to defending those first 11 chapters of Genesis so that you can trust the rest of your Bible. You see, if you get rid of Genesis 3, then you get rid of original sin, which means you don't need a savior. If you get rid of the fact that you're fearfully and wonderfully made by a unique, special, creative work of God, well, then you're just an accident of science. There's no final authority, and you make your own rules. These are the things that hang in the balance with this book. And so chapter 7, a very important chapter, because here it is stipulated to us that this entire world has been covered with water. And if it's been covered with water, then we ought to find evidence of not only the earth being covered with water, but everything that lived on it being swept away, crushed and compact, and buried. We call those fossils. Chapter 7, verse 1. The Lord said to Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for there, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. If every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and his female, and you know from Leviticus 11, that means they divide the hoof and? Nice, gold stars in heaven on your record for that one. Chew the cud. By sevens, the male and his female, and of beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female, verse three, and of the fowls also of the air by sevens, the male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights. <clears throat> and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. And Noah was six hundred years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. Noah went in and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood. Not a trick question. How many are on the ark? How many came up with eight? How many are still counting? <laughs> Why is that important? Because when we get to Genesis 19, and yes, we will get there, the end of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. In chapter 18, you have Abraham interceding before the capital L-O-R-D, Yahweh himself. He said, what if there's 50? They get all the way down to 10. And he said, if I find 10 righteous, I will not destroy the city. Well, you know what happened. And if you don't, you will in a few weeks. And that is, he sent in two angels. They had to take Lot, his two daughters, and his wife by the hand and drag them out of Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> Gee. And then the judgment came. I'd be concerned if there were 12 on the ark. Or 10. But it's less than 10, the very number that was used to spare Sodom and Gomorrah. If there's 10 or 10, at least 10, I'll spare it. There were less than 10. Judgment came and wiped out Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them. That brings us to a very interesting thought. The Lord himself will descend with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be suddenly snatched away with, with great force, harpazo, raptured out from here to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. When the Lord suddenly removes his church, at that instant, there are less than 10 righteous. That would be the perfect time to start again, judgment. Just a thought, but we're in Genesis, so we'll leave that book at 2 Thessalonians alone and 1 Thessalonians. Of clean beasts, verse 8, and of beasts that are not clean, of fowls, and of everything that creepeth upon the earth, there went in two and two unto Noah into the ark, the male and the female, as God commanded Noah. And it came to pass after seven days, seven days of a door being wide open, that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, a seismic, most likely volcanic event, and the ridges around the ocean parallel the mountain chains. These things begin to erupt, plates, you know, matter begins to come out, magma begins to push the plates, they begin to move, water being thrown in tsunamis over repeatedly, the crust of the earth, it eventually gets covered, liquefaction begins to happen, things begin to get buried and sorted, we've been through all that. You should know that by now if you've been with us. Fountains of the great deep were broken up. The windows of heaven were loosed, and it seems the majority of the water has come from underneath the earth's crust. Where did it go? We'll show you that later. We now found it. 
That's new since the last time we went through. We know where it is now. The windows of heaven were opened, rain also coming down. And the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. And in the self same day, verse 13, entered Noah, Shem, and Ham, Japheth, and the sons of Noah. Noah's wife, which tradition says Tamar, will ask in heaven. And the three wives of his sons with them into the ark. They and every beast after his kind, which we've covered, every cattle after their kind, every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and every fowl after his kind, and every bird of every sort. And they went in unto Noah, verse 15, into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. <clears throat> and they that went in, went in, male and female of all flesh, as God commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. A day came when the door was shut by God himself, and that is it. Judgment followed. And the flood was 40 days upon the earth. And the waters increased and bare up the ark, and it was lifted up above the earth. And the waters prevailed and increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark went up upon the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered 15 cubits upward, at least 22 to 28, maybe even 30 feet, depending on the length of the cubit. 20 solid feet at least, 22 to 20, 28, covered, which is why we find on the top of Mount Everest seashells. And the waters prevailed, and the mountains were covered. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, land animals, both the fowl and of cattle and of beast and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth and every man. And in whose nostrils was the breath of life of all that was in the dry land died. And every living substance was destroyed, ecosystem after ecosystem, wetlands, forests, trees, you name it, died, suddenly ripped apart. Every living substance was destroyed upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle, creeping thing, and the fowl of the heaven, and they were destroyed from the earth, and Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed upon the earth 150 days. So we are being told that on this earth, the entire planet was covered with water. As those fountains broke up, cataclysmic, violent action occurred that wiped out the things that were living on the surface, the dry land of the earth. It would wipe out again the ecosystems that support them. It would begin to bring up dirt and sediment from that volcanic activity with ash. And these things would begin to suddenly bury all kinds of living things as well as ecosystems. And as they get compressed and they get put down in these layers, they would eventually, we'd expect, turn into coal. So let's see what the earth has for us. And let's go with the first condition, the first question of, gee, do we have anything to show us that we may have had a global flood event? These videos that I'm going to show to you, please listen to them very carefully because they're going to talk about these layers. And if you're listening, you're going to hear them tell you these layers are not only across the entire United States, they're around the world, which means the entire world had a similar event where water, material, and living things suddenly all interact and get buried. That would be a flood. When we think about the history of the Earth, there are a lot of things we need to consider. But one of the most fascinating is the account of the flood. Was the whole Earth covered with water? Genesis says the waters prevailed so mightily on the Earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. So if the flood was truly global, wouldn't there be a lot of evidence? I'd heard of a scientist who had spent over 40 years studying this question. When I spoke to him, he said he had a great place where we could see evidence for the global flood. Steve, I gotta admit, I, I've been here several times, but every time I come here, it is breathtaking. As, besides being at home, uh, Grand Canyon <laughs> is my favorite yeah. place on earth. Yeah. So, Steve, tell me, what, what do you see here? When we look at Grand Canyon, we see the inside story to the ground beneath our feet. And we kind of have a layer cake here, don't we, of strata that have been eroded for our benefit to see the inside structure of the Earth. These same layers are also in Colorado. We're also in Illinois, also in Pennsylvania. Right so when here. you say sedimentary strata, you're talking about the layers that we see. Yes. So the lowest layers are formed first, 
Those are sediment grains that were mixed, separated, and flowed in here from different directions and accumulated one on top of another. And then, of course, naturally, they convert to rock. So you're saying that the solid ground we're standing on right now, if we went back in its history, it'd be liquid? Yes. So the ocean is doing some amazing things, and water of, of incredible power is depositing the layers we see in the canyon. And are there fossils in all of those layers? There are marine fossils through all the layers. Uh, but the standard explanation is there were 17 different advances and retreats of the ocean over the North American continent. And it was extended over hundreds of millions of years. And what is the evidence that you see here that would say that doesn't seem to make sense? The 4,000 feet uh, flat-lying strata in the canyon are flat. And relative to one another, we look in between the strata layers and we don't see the passage of time in between layers. You mean erosion? Erosion, especially, and channeling uh, on any great scale is not visible. And then we look at the strata themselves, and they provide evidence of rapid, very rapid sedimentation. Just minutes or hours is all that's needed to make layers. Well, tell me about the story of these layers. I mean, how did they get here? In the 600th year of Noah's life, on the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. My understanding is the ocean floor upheaval occurred. Some type of magma or mm -hmm. earthquake propelled the oceans over the continent. So that's why we get uh, these marine fossils in these layers. Yes, and we have six months the waters prevailed upon the earth, another seven months or so for the water to subside. The 4,000 feet of strata probably represents the early and middle part of the global flood right here in Grand Canyon. We have other strata locally in this Grand Canyon region. That's called the Grand Staircase. We have about 10,000 feet, two miles thickness of strata on top of the Grand Canyon. Higher than where we are. Higher than where we are. And that represents the, the later stages of the flood and the retreat of the floodwater. This surface was beveled by retreat of floodwaters. And as the flood retreated into the newly formed ocean basins, then the continents probably uplifted, and the ark, of course, was landed in the high country in the Middle East. Well, there are some people who say that that record is about a local flood. I believe it's a global flood, and all the high hills are the whole heaven were covered, a universal statement. But that mountains have risen since then, and we shouldn't measure the depth of the floodwaters by the present mountains of the earth, which are largely created during the flood and after the flood. Well, the fact that we have all of these layers um, would be unknown to us if we were standing on them, you know, somewhere else, but they're known to us because they've been cut out. How did that happen? Well, it was a story that we all learned in grammar school, okay? Colorado River, over tens of millions of years, cut the Grand Canyon. Most geologists have jettisoned that idea. It's hard to sustain a canyon like this for uh, tens of millions of years. It, it, you can't imagine a canyon enduring that long with erosion. Is that because it would have eventually the sides would have collapsed and yes. broken down? Then how in the world do we get this all carved out? Well, uh, there are lots of theories. And uh, personally, I like the idea of catastrophic erosion by drainage of lakes. So after the flood, we have these large bodies of water, these lakes that are trapped. There's evidence of the big lake in the Painted Desert, a place called Hopi Buttes, mm. about 500 cubic miles of water in this huge lake. And it so the dam breaks and all of that massive amount of water then is now pouring out and carving this. Yes, and uh, how long would it take to erode Grand Canyon? Maybe weeks, but not uh, millions of years. Time is not a magic wand mm -hmm. that solves all the geologic problems of the world. Jettison that way of thinking about millions of years and then start thinking about catastrophic process like you've seen at Mount St. Helens, and that'll help you understand Grand Canyon. So here's the standard textbook, <clears throat> Prentice Hall, General Science 1992. Over millions of years, the Colorado River has carved the Grand Canyon from solid rock. How many of you got a little rain over the last few days? Anybody here done some gardening or earthwork? 
If you have, how many noticed you've got erosion, you've got channeling? If you're driving by a development, they've got those erosion fences out, runoff fences, and you can see where it's already just the stuff. Maybe they just did your lawn, put it all out, hydro seeded it, and off it went. We bought our house years ago. They hydro seeded it. We had 11 days of rain. The entire lawn ended up in the back with channels and ruts and ridges in 11 days. <laughs> you know, look like mini Grand Canyons. In between those layers, there's virtually no erosion. If these layers take millions of years, there should be erosion between them. And in each of these layers you heard about, there are fossils. And we showed you fossils where, for example, the ichthyosaur was giving birth. That was rapidly, quickly trapped and buried in a layer of sediment that gave that fossil. As we've also seen predators being eaten by, or prey being eaten by the predators fossilized. They just get crunched as they're about to have lunch. These things are observed. And yet all these layers have things that had to have died suddenly, buried rapidly, so that they are kept away from air so they don't decay and just get scattered. Again, same thing here, Colorado River, upon cut through layers of rock, millions of years, Prentice Hall Biology, 1998. Now, I'm gonna state the obvious. The river enters the canyon at 2,800 feet and it exits at 1,800 feet because everybody knows water runs downhill. At the end of the Nile River, you will find the Nile River Delta. At the end of the Mississippi, you'll find the Mississippi River Delta. At the end of the Colorado River, you'll find very little which means that Colorado River and bringing that material out of the canyon didn't do it slowly because we'd have a delta. It had to have been fast and powerful to give the appearance that it has. Now there's something else you need to know, and that is they have found that clearly we've got seashells and other things. They've all agreed pretty much there had to be large water on the surface of the United States and eventually washed out. And the argument is if Grand Canyon were like a dam and that got breached, it would easily move enough water through it to carve it very quickly. And so now we're going to look at the Grand Canyon from a topographical point of view. Again, at the right, you'll see it enters at 2,800 feet. You'll see it exits at 1,800 feet. But how many notice snow on the right and left-hand side of the canyon? That is the Kayabab uplift. The Kayabab uplift is 6,900 feet to 8,500 feet in elevation, about a mile or so above the bottom where the river is flowing. This is most likely where the dam occurred. Because again, it cut right through this, which means that the Colorado River had to flow uphill for millions of years, close to a mile, to cut that canyon, which doesn't make any sense, which is why they're backing away from that opinion. And now they start talking about perhaps a breached land dam with water behind it. So once again, 8,500 feet at the peak, 1,800 feet down where the river is. That's an interesting feat to flow uphill for millions of years going through an uplift. What does make sense is a flood. So let's look at another clip about that. Everywhere we looked, Steve showed me evidence of the incredible power of moving water. It quickly laid down these enormous layers, then quickly eroded them away. Steve wanted to show me where the floodwaters first hit the continent so he took me deeper into the canyon. Listen carefully for where these layers Steve, are when you said you were going to bring me to the bottom, you, you weren't kidding where you were. At, we're at the bottom, aren't we? So we're in this uh, big side canyon to the, the main Grand Canyon, and we're looking at the granite basement rock, which is the, the core of the continent, if you will. And then we see the flat-lying strata on top of it. The boundary between the granite rock below and the tapit sandstone above is this surface we call the Great Unconformity. Why, why does it appear to be such a, a stark line? I mean, uh, it's clear. I think it's an erosional boundary of colossal scale. We're looking at something that uh, shows the, the magnitude of flood flow over a surface. And is it just here? The Great Unconformity is continent-wide. I've seen it, I believe, in the Middle East. It's over in Europe. Uh, it's in Africa, and here it is uh, under the North American continent. So we've got this uh, layer. How thick is this layer? What goes up from here? Well, we have the sock mega sequence here, if you will, a thousand feet of sandstone, shale, limestone that goes continent wide. There are four other big sequence packages of strata that sit above it. Those are also very continuous, like this. What we're seeing here is rather representative of the rest of the world. 
it makes one uh, really question the notion that this all happened because of a small local flood. We're talking about something enormous. The power moving water was beveling and pulverizing rock, depositing great thicknesses of layers and calling our minds to think about a global flood. The conventional story is entirely different though. It would say that there is a lot of time between each of these layers. Some people have said that the Great Unconformity boundary here represents half a billion years. You mean between the granite we see in that first layer of the sedimentary rock? Yeah, they say that there may be half a billion years there, okay? And that's what their explanation of uh, Earth history would ask them to consider. Yet when you come here and look at this, nearly a featureless plane. Uh -huh. It's not an exactly a plane, but it's a gently rolling surface. Mm -hmm. And would that be the product of billions of years? Or would that be the product of the power of water planing off a surface? Time is foreign to a good explanation here. Mm -hmm. And so we want to explain what we see. As they said, these layers are all around the world and they've all got things buried in them. And they appear to have happened quickly. So in 1980, Mount St. Helens erupted. And when that happened, that actually gave us a working lab of what can happen geologically in a matter of short matter of time with mud flows, water, and other things that happened. I became a believer in 1989. In 1990, I'm sitting in a Bible college, and they had someone come out from the Institute for Creation Research, and he was sharing about how it, there's never been a better time in history <clears throat> to be a believer in Jesus because of the geological information that's been coming out out of Mount St. Helens and as our technology improves. And I would tell you now, some 30 plus years later, it's been even a better time to be someone who believes what the Bible says as they study the genome, as biologists realize you can't just get living material from non-living material and on and on and on in the different disciplines. Well, let's learn some things about Mount St. Helens. Number one, it was pretty small, a little puff compared to Tambora. Krakatoa, second place. Vesuvius, third place. Mount St. Helens comes in a dead last among those. And if you remember the tsunami waves I showed you, there was a tsunami wave that came out of Mount St. Helens. Remember that in that video that showed the heights of them? So it was still a pretty big event. And let's learn about it. Mount St. Helens, uh, which is a volcano in Washington State, erupted uh, in May of 1980. Many people remember that eruption because it was very well publicized and covered by the press. And Mount St. Helens is very exciting for creation scientists because it demonstrates that much geological work can be done in a very short amount of time. Not just the initial eruption itself in May of 1980, but there were subsequent eruptions later on and subsequent geological activity that occurred later. For one thing, about two years after that initial eruption, there was some mud flows that actually carved out a canyon that is essentially a 140th scale model of the Grand Canyon, and it happened in a single day. And people may have heard of the petrified forest at Yellowstone National Park. And the conventional thinking is that those trees are forests that grew there in place. They were covered by ash, volcanic ash. They became petrified. Over time, another forest grew up in place. It was covered in ash. It got petrified and so on and so forth. And if you look at the number of layers that you have at Yellowstone National Park, now you're looking at a time scale of maybe 40,000 years. And obviously that does not fit the Bible's relatively short time scale of about 6,000 years. So the reason Mount St. Helens is so exciting is that as a result of that eruption, you ended up with millions of logs that were floating in Spirit Lake. And if you remember the eruption, you probably remember seeing aerial footage of just millions of logs that were just floating in these log mats on the lake. And what happened is that these logs became waterlogged and they began to rotate upright and they would sink down into the lake. And so you ended up with all these tree stumps that are vertical in the sediment, uh, very similar to what we see at Yellowstone National Park. So we think we now see at Mount St. Helens how that petrified forest was actually formed. So you have basically arguments for an old earth that Mount St. Helens has really done a lot to topple. So this is a strong exhibit uh, for the fact that uh, lots of geological work can be done in a very short time.
So just to give you some photos, here's some of the ash that came out of the eruption. It spread across a good part of the northwestern United States, and this was a little volcano. Buried things very quickly, blew, blew forest just completely off the hills. And so what he's talking about here is what happened in Spirit Lake. <clears throat> Here's Bob Jones, Earth Science, 1993, page 307, and they're showing some of the research on this. And so Spirit Lake was covered. You could actually walk across it. It was so covered with logs. And it would basically sit there. They would rub the bark and other things would come off. That would begin to go down to the bottom. And the debris that came off from the explosion as well as the trees was at the bottom found to be orderly in layers. So it just went down and did the same thing we see like with Grand Canyon, just immediately formed into layers. And then as the logs would get waterlogged, they would pitch upright, they would go down, and they would basically bury themselves down into those mud layers, some as far as 15 feet deep into it. Here's the thing. Some of the trees are oriented correctly, some of them are diagonal, and some of them are upside down with the roots sticking out. And so here you've got these trees growing through all these different layers of strata and their roots are sticking out. And that began to explain to geologists what they see around the world. And this is around the world where we've got these polystrate trees that are going through different layers. The layers are supposed to be millions of years old and some of the layers are going through are coal, which are all the things that were alive when the flood hit. And some are upside down, some are right side up, and some are diagonal. And they would scratch their heads saying, how can a tree grow with its roots sitting out of the ground for millions of years through these layers? Well, now we know, thanks to Mount St. Helens. These are in Germany, France, the British Isles, Nova Scotia, California, other eastern states. These things are found around the world, these polystrate trees that are going through these different layers. And again, often found with coal. Here they are in France, and again, some upside down, and it made no sense until Mount St. Helens and a cataclysmic event where fountains are broken up, water starts moving. So with Yellowstone, they have 27 layers. And again, they say, well, this must have been very slow. No, this could be very quick with a global flood, liquefaction, and wave after wave as things are breaking up, going around. So the evidence we see around the planet, thanks to Mount St. Helens, affirms the idea of a global flood. It's the best answer to get how did these things get there and why are they upside down? through layers that are supposedly millions of years old. ICR, Institute for Creation Research, in 1976 put out this article four years before Mount St. Helens. And they said, it's not uncommon to find marine fossils such as fish, mollusks, and brachiopods and coal, coal balls, which are rounded masses of matted and exceptionally well-preserved plant and animal fossils, pre-flood existence, including marine creatures, are found within coal strata and associated with coal strata. Among the most fascinating types of fossils associated with coal seams are upright tree trunks, which often penetrate tens of feet perpendicular to stratification. And these feet, these layers are supposedly millions of years old. These upright trees are frequently encountered in strata associated with coal, and on rare occasions are found in the coal. In each case, the sediments must have amassed in a short time to cover the tree before it could rot and fall down. One's first impression may be that these upright trees are in their original growth position, but several lines of evidence indicate otherwise. Some of the trees penetrate the strata diagonally, <clears throat> while others are found upside down four years before Mount St. Helens. And they're going, why is this showing up like this? It makes no sense. And then Mount St. Helens blew up, and suddenly everything made sense. It would be a flood. So the question comes up, didn't it take millions of years to make Grand Canyon? Well, let's go with the facts. Number one, Grand Canyon exists. Are everybody okay with that fact? Any, any canyon deniers? <laughs> the evolutionists have their interpretation. Those who believe in God's word have their own interpretation. The evolutionists say it's formed slowly by a little water and lots of time. But there's no erosion between the layers. And in those layers are things that had to be trapped quickly by the layer to be kept as a fossil. Time doesn't fit that. Biblical creation aside, is it formed very quickly with a lot of water in a little time. Next thing, the earth has layers of sedimentary rock, not just Grand Canyon, but under us. And it's around the earth, sedimentary rock on the whole planet. Why? Because water and dirt and material got all churned up in the flood, and then the water receded, these things hardened, you got sedimentary rock, you got layers of limestone all around the world. Their theory, the layers formed slowly over millions of years, yet somehow buried things within them and kept them fossilized. 
Bible says, again, the layers came directly from the flood, a global judgment, which is a warning for a future judgment when Christ returns. Okay, so let's look at Mount St. Helens one more time. Let's see what else they learned. The idea that sediment layers can form quickly was documented in a dramatic way in 1980 with the eruption of Mount St. Helens. The initial blast was a horizontally directed steam explosion with the power of 21 megaton bombs that flattened in seconds 230 square miles of lush conifer forest. And following that, there was nine hours of eruption of mostly vertical ash uh, driven by steam, that much of which fell down vertically back, back to the ground and resulted in a horizontal pyroclastic flow, hot volcanic ash flowing at roughly 100 miles an hour. This material formed orderly layers of material, just sediment layers, some just a, a fraction of an inch thick, and they had tens of feet, hundreds of feet thickness of this material, demonstrated very clearly how rapidly ordered layered sediments can form. Uh, moreover, a single mud flow following the eruption resulted in the carving of a canyon, 1 40th the scale of the Grand Canyon in one afternoon through this layered debris. So it also demonstrated that canyons can be cut very rapidly, within hours. And all those layers are tight. No erosion between them. So looking at what we see with Grand Canyon, the best example is it was covered with water. It formed quickly, and there was no time to erode between the layers. It was wave after wave after wave of the flood. So here they were looking at the Mediterranean Sea, and this came out in 2009, and as they looked at it, they said, well, we think this thing formed when the dam breached around Gibraltar. Of course, they say we think it took thousands of years. However, 90% of the water probably did most of the work within two months to maybe two years. Most of the water came in within two months to two years. Even the Mediterranean, the only way to explain it is massive amount of water quickly breaching through Gibraltar, perhaps, and blowing out this basin. That would fit a flood. So these things are around the earth. We can see them. But Pastor Chris, Pastor Chris, yeah, everything's millions of years old, right? <laughs> things have changed a lot since the last time we did this book. It's going to blow your minds with what you get to see. But of course, we're out of time, and that's going to have to be next week. Is Genesis history? I encourage you to get it. It is worth watching. We had two clips from that today. Institute for Creation Research, we had two different clips from that also, Unlocking the Mysteries of Genesis. We'll have some more. Both these guys have great stuff on the fossils as far as what's out there in dinosaur bones. Answers in Genesis, doing lots of great research. Dr. Dino, thanks to his slides. Here's what it means to you today. If you have eyes to see, the best way to interpret the geological formations we see around the Earth would be a global flood. That is really the most, if you can honestly look at the fact there's no erosion between these layers, they're around the planet, and everything stuck in them was buried quickly without warning. That fits a flood. And if that's true, then there's a God who created you for a relationship with him. There's a day coming when again this earth is going to face a final judgment. And right now the door of salvation is wide open. If you're willing to accept Christ as your Savior, ask his forgiveness for your sins. You will be born again by the Holy Spirit. God will put his peace and his joy and his love in you, and your life will begin to change. But you have to be willing to believe what he's told you in his word. Genesis 7 is a fantastic chapter because he told us something happened. Peter doubles down and says it's proof of what's also coming. And now with time and technology and what is clearly these last days, we have the best evidence the church has ever had in its history to say that's the answer. So now the question is what are you going to do with it? Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the research and the hard work that we enjoy from these ministries and have a few more things to go. Thank you, Lord, for those men and women of science who have made it their life's work to believe your word and to hunt for evidence and to find it. And so, Lord, how I pray for the scoffers who are watching. They have been saying, where is the promise of his coming? Oh, he's coming. May their hearts be open, Lord. They are here for more than just this life. They are here to know you personally. 
That's when joy and peace begin. And so, Lord, how I pray for anyone listening now or in the future, this is between you and them. No man can come to the Father except he draw them. And so, Father, I pray you draw them to yourself and reveal your Son to their, lot, to their eyes. Thank you for today, Lord. Bless your people as we go, and thank you for this great nation. May it stand true to its core principles. In Jesus' name, amen.